we are focusing on the pre-war cars now. So it's lovely to see them out there. It's been a bit of a delay, I'm afraid. Sorry to all of you who've been waiting to see these beautiful machines out on track. But here we go now. Philip Champion in the Fraser Nash Supersports just taking to the circuit there. That red machine, 1928, that was built. It has a 1500cc engine. Uh, so a real mix of power, of uh, ability and uh, quickness. This is a, a potentially quick car, though, as we said before. Frederick Wakeman and Patrick Blakeney Edwards are sharing the Fraser Nash replica. Um, they were called replica even in the day. It doesn't mean it's a replica at all. Um, that was what they were called back then, wasn't it? Absolutely, and that really is a real one. It's uh, very original. And that's Fred Wakeman, the owner at the wheel, the taller uh, shape of, of, of Fred there. Patrick will take <laughs> over for the second part of the session. It's a bit easier to tell, isn't it, in a car like this, yes. as opposed to a, a sort of modern um, world endurance car when they get in. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can barely see the driver yeah. in those cockpits nowadays. Right. Thankfully, here, we can actually see them. Absolutely, and, and you can see them working as well. And when, when the cars start to really press on, uh, we'll be able to see the drivers leaning over, trying to get the weight onto the inside of the corner. Uh, and uh, Fred Wakeman and Patrick Blakeney Edwards in, in that car, we, we said earlier on, they'll be one of the front runners. Uh, 110 miles an hour that car will do and it's chain driven being a Fraser Nash as is the Morgan that we saw earlier with uh, Sue Derbyshire talking to Ed earlier on uh, chain driven and uh, it really was early technology yes absolutely and they're very very effective as well so hopefully we'll see a bit of action uh, there's the uh, Tolo Lago the number 40 car we saw that uh, before they all headed out it's a very beautiful car yeah. aerodynamic with the, um, the the way they did the the sort of uh, the wings, if you call it, the, the, the wheel guards, uh, much more aerodynamic than many other vehicles at the time. Yes, it's interesting. Uh, Pre-war 1936 car, and uh, not much was known about aerodynamics at the time. Certainly, the Bentleys uh, of a, a similar era were not aerodynamic at all. Um, but yes, uh, some of the designers were moving into the area of just making the cars a bit more slippery, as we see Fred Wakeman in the uh, number 11 um, Fraser Nash which uh, is making its way through Luffield. And uh, even though these cars are getting on for 100 years old, they are moving around quite a bit on the track, and we'll see those cars sliding. Uh, tiny little wheels. Yeah, but that's also lovely. As you say, very narrow tyres, so not a lot of grip. Um, and this is a corner that in a Formula 1 car might be flat out, but it's not going to be in one of these. It's still quite a fast corner, of course, as they come through Cops. Let's see how much steering effort's going on. Yeah, a little, little bit of play on the steering. We'll see a bit more of that, I'm sure, as we continue. External gear change, so he reaches out to his right-hand side, outside the cockpit, to change gear. And now he comes through into the Maggots Beckett section as well. And there you can see a little bit of sliding around. Nice control, keeping it all together, not letting it get too far away. And uh, this is definitely going to be one of the front runners in this race, particularly when Pat Blakeney Edwards gets in it. It's absolutely... Um, uh, well, actually, Fred, over the last couple of years, with Patrick's help coaching him, is almost as quick. They are a very, very quick team in this pre-war racing. And you could see there, as he was going through Beckett's, the car was understeering, then oversteering a bit. You can also see how he crouches down, down the straight. That's aerodynamic, isn't it? He's, he's trying to come in in karting, if we do that sometimes, just to try and reduce the aerodynamic drag, and he just dips his head down, trying to get a little bit more straight line speed. That's right, yes. Oh, and lovely, lovely slide there, just putting an opposite lock on to, to control the car as it goes through. It is rear-wheel drive, and then uh, through into the tight section at uh, Club Corner. We're using the historic club, which is not quite as tight as the Formula One circuit, so it's not the very sharp left and right as he comes through to complete a lap. I think in modern parlance, then, we call this a banker lap, Fred. Yes, and uh, let's have a look. It's a three minute ten, so that's the first of the sort of representative laps, and we expect that to be one of the front runners, there's no doubt about it. Um, so we shall see. And there's a whole bunch of cars going down towards... Co seems a bit ironic, doesn't it, when we've got such a big track. Um, and OK, we've got plenty of cars. There's 33 cars out there, but it seems a shame that they're all actually kind of this little bunch going around together and not on clear space. <laughs> yes. Yeah, a lot of spray again. It's surprising. The, the narrow tyres do throw up quite a bit of spray. Um, but they're uh, coming through maggots there, and you can see two, three abreast as they come up towards the Beckett's complex. Reckoned to be one of the greatest sequence of corners in the world for Formula One racing, uh, and it certainly carries across into historic racing as well. It's a superb section of the circuit. 
Yeah, no, very, very impressive indeed. Uh, Pat Blakeney Edwards is actually involved in two entries today. Presumably he is in the other car at the moment, the, the number seven car that's gone second fastest because he's going to have to swap over later on. And as you said, um, Wakeman's in the, in the number 11 car currently. So uh, it seems funny, but Pat Blakeney Edwards is one of those drivers, and we will see this perhaps in a couple of other races where he's not only in one car, He'll jump from one car to another. Now, there's the Morgan we were looking at a little bit earlier on. Fabulous, isn't it? The three-wheeler. The three-wheeler Morgan, yes. It's uh, uh, the number 35 car you're seeing there on screen uh, with Sue Derbyshire and Ewan Cameron. Um, didn't spot who was in that then. I'll have a look uh, when, they come, when we get back onto it. But, uh, yeah, a th three-wheeler with the uh, driven wheel is the single wheel at the back. You might think it would be better to drive the front wheels, but no, it's rear-wheel drive, single wheel. But as you heard Sue Darbush say earlier, it handles really well uh, and it's top speed about 105 miles an hour. So she's not as quick as some of the bigger cars. That looks like Sue driving because uh, Ewan Cameron and her co-driver wears a black crash helmet. So we'll see him get in the car later on. Yeah, it's going well at the moment, isn't it? So it uh, might be able to pick up a place or two. Um, quite a few cars have now done a lap, but uh, there's no denying that uh, Fred Wakeman is fastest by quite a big margin currently. Plenty of time to go, though, in this session. We've still got just under 15 minutes left, and hopefully they can get a good, clear run to the chequered flag, unlike the former juniors that ended up sitting behind the safety car for quite a long time. We're just getting a little bit of brightness poking its way into our commentary box now, which is nice to see. Um, the, the odd little patch of blue sky above us, there's still quite a lot of grey around, but it's suddenly beginning to feel a little bit more summery than it was when we first arrived early this morning, when it was really rather bleak and grey and, and raining. Uh, but brightening up, and, and, and that's going to be fun for everybody, because the track will get a little bit more grip as they continue around. And it's very well drained, the sort of uh, circuit, and if we've got a bit of breeze out there, it will hopefully dry the surface quite quickly. Although these cars won't really squeegee the water off uh, very well. The, the, the faster cars with the wider tyres will tend to clear the water. Lovely that we're sticking with Sue Derbyshire there as she makes her way up over the rise. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the difference in size of the car, the, uh, the car she's alongside. The number 75, Stephen Skipworth, James Dean shared at Aston Martin Monoposto speed model. Uh, she managed to get through on the approach to Beckett's there. Yeah, very impressive. Uh, made it look very easy. Uh, and yet it can't be that easy, can it, driving a, a car like this, but great effort. Good lap uh, just come in from the number 22 car of Clive Morley. That's one of the Bentleys. That's just gone second quickest, although in the meantime, uh, Fred Wakeman's gone even quicker. Frederick Wakeman in the Fraser Nash has down, now done a three minute four, but we've got a Bentley up there up into second place. And a few more changes coming through. Number 99 car of Ewan Jetley and Robin Tului. Another Bentley. That's moved up there into fourth position. And number 70 as well. That's Richard Bradley. We're expecting Richard to be pretty rapid. He's in the outer sports. Um, he's actually running with Gareth Burnett uh, on this one, isn't he? Yes, uh, Gareth Burnett's um, non-started his car. But he's shifted across to share with Richard Bradley, the same Richard Bradley we saw out in the, the juniors earlier, and uh, a, a, a contemporary uh, sports car driver as well. But Gareth Burnett, very quick indeed. So that's another very strong pairing that we'll probably see uh, at the head of the field in the race tomorrow. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing that. And um, we are seeing a, a few changes as they come over the line. People getting a little more confident now that they've got a bit more track experience and a couple of laps underneath them, seeing where there's grip and where there isn't. Um, there's a rather lovely Bentley heading down towards Brooklands with the tape on the lights, which uh, they had to do, of course, in racing terms. That's the number 99 car, you and Getley and Robin Tului. Uh, that's going well at the moment, uh, up in there in fourth place. Uh, Robin Tului is a very interesting person. He'll, I, I think that looks like uh, Ewan uh, in at the moment, but uh, Robin has worked for a number of car manufacturers including Mercedes on their Grand Prix car and uh, the uh, MotoGP motorbikes as well he's uh, a very very clever man but a very quick driver as well so that's another strong pairing where the cameras are picking up some of our leading cars uh, as we go through this session let's have a look at through Cox Corner how much how much work is going on on the steering wheel here that's pretty smooth it's pretty controlled I have to say nice job done there and uh, quick check in the, in the single, well, you've got a central mirror and a right-hand mirror, so you can keep an eye on what's going on behind. 
but it is still Fred uh, Frederick Wakeman who is setting the pace in this pre-war PRDC 500 qualifying. Oh, that was a bit of a slide. <laughs> he gathered it together pretty well. Nicely done. And the Bentley continues on its way around. And uh, so 35 cars now have been out on track. Um, there's one that's not set a full time yet. That's Stephen Archer in the Aston Martin Ulster. He did a part of a lap, but he hasn't completed a whole lap. But everybody else, 34 cars, have at least completed one lap now. And they're going to need to be on their toes with their driver changes where they're sharing cars because uh, due to the delay, they've got a slightly shortened session. So uh, rather than the normal time they would have had, they're, they're, uh, they're reduced by four minutes. So with the long lap that we already mentioned, they do need to be into the pits, probably on this lap now, to switch over those that are changing drivers. Yeah, that is an advantage, obviously, for those who are not really, isn't it? Because uh, they'll get more laps in and more opportunity to qualify. But that's, that's part and parcel of it. And, uh, of course, sharing the car sometimes means you can share the costs, which can be pretty crucial, uh, and have fun with somebody else doing it with you. In, uh, another good lap by uh, Clive Morley on that last lap, so he's gone second quickest. But there are quite a few improvements coming through all the time now. Um, there's back with the Clive Morley's car, so he's done a good job to go second fastest. Beautiful Bentley, and look at that lovely car control. Really lovely. Bit of a late oversteer, good correction, and kept it going beautifully. <laughs> and that's what's so wonderful to see with these machines. They're not um, uh, sparing the horses, are they? 1926 that car was built, so <laughs> uh, he's not really showing it that much respect. Uh, oh, he thinks he might have an issue there, does he? No, he's uh, back on uh, looking forward again. Just wondered if he might have a problem with that external brake. Yeah. Did look a bit weird, didn't he? Yeah. He was definitely checking something. I couldn't quite see. I can't see what it was, but he's still slithering he's got, around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's one-handed, as he's uh, using that gear lever over on the right. Let's see how he comes out of Luffield. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, I thought he was. No, there is a problem. There is a problem. Yeah, he's pulling into the pit. There's something wasn't driving properly. It seems to be maybe cutting out. He's having a quick look down. I wonder what's going on there. It could be something as simple as there's something loose around his yeah, feet. It's yeah. uh, quite possible that uh, something's come loose, but he's got his he's got the lap time in, hasn't he? So he's uh, second quickest at the moment. Yes, indeed. He's looking a bit further down that list uh, currently. Down at the bottom there, as I mentioned, the number 17 car, Stephen Archer. He's not set a time. He is in the pits, so there's clearly a little bit of a problem there. Uh, we're looking at the number five car. Richard and Tanya Pilkington are sharing this uh, Talbo, the T26 SS. This is a 4.4 litre machine and uh, built in 1937. So this is one of the later cars, effectively, of this group because we're talking about pre-war cars. That's a 1937 car. Uh, there are not many others in this category that are uh, of that sort of age. We've got a 1938 uh, Aston Martin 2-litre with David Ozan driving that. So, and a couple of, we do have a 1939 Aston as well, don't we? The Monoposto speed model of Steve Skipworth and James Dean. Yes, it was a, a the development pre-war uh, of the cars uh, was all halted during the war and then immediately post-war, there wasn't much changed. They just came out with the same cars again, but then things started to change in the, uh, the mid-40s uh, to the late 40s and then into the 50s. Of course, we started with the World Championship in Formula One uh, here at Silverstone in the first race in Silverstone, 1948. Uh, Post-war, after the RAF station here was decommissioned. Very different uh, layout then, wasn't it? It was like a big X, wasn't it? It was sort of yeah. in and out yes. into the airfield and back out. Uh, frightening in these days of health and safety. Yeah. They were driving towards each Opposite other. each other, yeah. Separated by a row of oil drums uh, at full speed. But then fairly quickly it moved to the perimeter road, which yes. is familiar to many people. It's been modernised now, but uh, still using essentially the same uh, circuit. And of course, airfield perimeter roads a big factor in motorsport, didn't they? And in many ways were one of the things that really kicked British motorsport off in, in, in such a positive manner post-war. Not all the European drivers loved them initially, but uh, of course over the years people have very much got used to them because that's become much more common around the world. So, um, 
little bit of improvement we've just seen from the number 40 car of Till Bechtolsteimer. Sorry, I'll get that right in a minute. Uh, that's another of the uh, Talbos, the Talbo Largo. And uh, we're looking at Nigel Dowding. Riley Brooklands, that's, uh, that's a favourite for me as well, the Riley Brooklands. It was based on the Riley 9, wasn't it? It was a, a racing version mm. that they genuinely did race at Brooklands in the day. Um, they were lowered and uh, they were very competitive. Not particularly powerful, they're, they're sort of one of the, the lower key cars, um, but nonetheless a, a very impressive machine. It's only got a, an 1100cc engine, but they can do some pretty special stuff with them. Yes, Brooklands was the, the first permanent circuit here in the UK, and unfortunately it was lost to the Second War because it was uh, used, uh, basically they built buildings on top of the track, so it was lost really, it could never be used again. But a lot of it is still there, and uh, you mentioned earlier about the Brooklyn's Museum. It's, it's a really a tremendous oh, attraction now, isn't it? Wonderful and, place. And you can still see the banking, which yeah. is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. And it is a great event. They've still got the Test Hill, haven't they, yeah. down there? Uh, it's a very steep hill, um, which they run cars up, see how they go. And uh, yes, well worth going to the Brooklyn's Museum if you're a fan of older cars. So we've still got a five minutes to run in this second qualifying session of the day, one that has been somewhat delayed, but thankfully we've now got the pre-war cars out on track. Having a quick look there at the number 91, Richard Hudson, Stuart Morley Bentley, uh, but also right there is the number 10 car, Philip Champion, his Fraser Nash Super Sports, another very competitive machine, 1500cc, a 1928 model, that one. And in the early days of Le Mans, where, when these, uh, the Bentleys uh, were racing at Le Mans, you used to have to do a lap with the hood up as well. So, uh, so they'd come into the pits, do, put the hood up, and uh, that was part of the regulation. So it's quite a, a different time. Yeah, it's a very different time. There's a really lovely close-up on that Fraser Nash. As you can see the effort that's going in. It's not so much physical effort, but it's, it's the sort of concentration and the feeling of the car and how much it's sliding around on those skinny, skinny tyres. Watch him on the exit. This is where we can see some sideways moments. It's pretty smooth, actually. That was very neat and tiny, which is probably the quickest way. You get two sideways, you're going to lose a lot of forward momentum. And so that's been nicely driven so far by Philip Chandler. Apparently 11th in the standings in a car that's got a lot less power than some of the others on the list, I have to say. So he's doing Good job so far. It's still the uh, Frederick Waitman machine that is fastest. I think Pat Blakeney Edwards may be in that car now because um, it did pit a lap or so ago. So we'll see if they get any more performance out of it. Three minutes and 4.357, the fastest lap so far. I think you're right, uh, Patrick is in the car now because we've got purple sectors uh, for that car. So. Uh, looks like it's improving its time and that's good news because hopefully the track is just starting to uh, get a little bit drier unfortunately we've lost that bit of sun you mentioned earlier yeah we'll, we'll not mention it again no i'll keep quiet <laughs> commentator's curse as ever david air in his bentley um, that's uh, actually an eight litre bentley um, that one so there's a really big motor in it but uh, as you can see it doesn't necessarily mean it's the fastest car out there there's plenty of others Ooh, that was a little bit close um, the car in front not aware that there was another car just about uh, to come past. Is that the Invicta? I think it is, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that is one of my favourite pre-war cars. The second of the two cars here, the number 51, is the Invicta S-Type. Absolutely wonderful machine. I remember as a kid having a book uh, with various great pre-war cars being mentioned, and that was one that really uh, struck with me. And there it is, just looking as though it might be coming through to lead this particular group. Moving to the outside there, and uh, that is the car being driven by this weekend by Chris and Nick Ball. They're sharing uh, the car. Four and a half litre, 1931, and the Invicta S-Type. There it is, leading that little group. Very low uh, seating position for the driver of, of, for, the, for the period. Um, a lot of cars were sit up and beg style, like the large car there in the middle of the group. You can see the driver driver's head way above everybody else, but the Invicta very low and I'm sure that would have attracted you in your youth when you looked at that picture yeah. very sporty I believe that um, F1 technical boss Ross Braun has an Invicta S type I don't know if he still has I know he, uh, certainly at one point he had one um, so it's lovely that people who are involved in modern Formula One also have a, uh, some of them not all of them some of them only like modern cars but there are some in Formula One who just love 
how cars have developed over the years. Now, there is the fastest car so far. And as you said, we believe it's now Pat Blakeney Edwards who's in the car. And he is a real pace setter, fast in every kind of classic car you can mention, really. We'll see him a lot over the course of the weekend. And he is putting together um, a reasonable lap at the moment. Although, let's see, that middle sector wasn't particularly quick. I think he got, got caught up in some traffic there. Look at that beautiful balance. Lovely, yes. And, and Patrick is such a demonstrative driver as well. He throws his body weight around in the car and hangs out on the side, particularly in Fred Wakeman's Fraser Nash. And uh, here he comes through Club Corner to complete a lap. And uh, very, very good to see sideways there across out of Club Corner and over the line. And uh, what sort of time did he do? Very Still fastest, but has he improved? Uh, let's have a look. No, I think no. It, no it's not quite an improvement. Um, 135. No, it's 3047 was the yeah 3047. The best was a 3043. So he was just a few tenths yeah. away from what it had been. So it's almost the same. He may well get another lap in. Uh, we're still green, aren't we? We've got 17 seconds to go. So he could well put in a really quick lap this next one around to make sure. They've got a big advantage already. They're seven seconds faster nearly than anybody else so far. We did see an example of there of what we'll see in the race uh, tomorrow, and that's that the drivers, are, because they're sitting out in the fresh air, they wave at each other and um, smile and laugh. And we saw Patrick there as he was coming down the hangar straight, just thanking one of the other drivers. Um, and another thing that he will always do is thank someone for being aware that he's there and coming through, perhaps lapping them. Checker flag is out, so we're on to our last flying lap. I think that's a part of uh, you know, driving these, these cars, is that you feel, because you're so open, open cockpit, not strapped in, as we were saying earlier, um, you almost feel much more connected to your competitor, you know, as you go past them. You're in this open air space. It's very different to being in an enclosed cockpit, I always think. Um, and I can understand why there is this, this good camaraderie, if yeah. you like, between drivers. And there has to be trust. I mean, there is nowhere near the safety. They're still doing very high speeds, as you mentioned. If you have an accident in one of these cars, you do not have much to protect you. So there has to be a huge amount of trust uh, between you and, 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 as I say, that camaraderie in historic racing is, is, yeah. is very important. And, and another thing, you, you do get quite big differentials in speed um, between the cars, because unlike a single make, or a single type of formula where all the cars are very, very close in, in time mm -hmm. and performance. These are, there's huge differences between these. So you are going to get a lot of uh, cars lapping other cars uh, and a, a number of occasions where, as we saw during that session, uh, there's a much slower car being passed by a faster one. And they need to be aware of that. Well, let's see if we're going to see any further changes. Uh, first sector for Pat Blakeney Edwards actually no quicker than they've already done. Um, currently, we've got uh, Chris, no, sorry, Clive Morley is second fastest. Third fastest is number 35, Morgan. Uh, how about that? So we spoke to Sue Derbyshire earlier on today. Uh, Sue and Ewan, uh, they have set the third fastest time in that little tiny Morgan. How about that? Yeah, I think uh, Sue is absolutely right. She's been driving that car for many, many years, as has Ewan as well. Uh, she knows precisely what the performance was likely to be. And she identified, didn't she, in the uh, chat with Ed, this is going to be quick in the wet. And uh, that's proved. It's certainly proved right, isn't it? Yeah, very, very impressive indeed. Only just off. Ah, oh, yeah, there's an improvement for Pat Blakeney Edwards. He's done a, a 301.792 now. There he is, just gone across the line in the Fraser Nash number 11. Um, so that is a very clear pole position. It looks as though, um, it's certainly if it's damp for the race, we know <laughs> who's got the big advantage. The likelihood is they probably will have it. Um, in the dry as well, but the Bentley that is currently likely to be up front with them, that of Clive Morley, that will have good straight line power and speed, so if it's dry, perhaps uh, they can make a bit more of a challenge.